We begin by praising Allah. We praise him, we seek his help, and we ask for his forgiveness, and we take refuge with Allah from the evil of our souls and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever guides, no one can misguide, and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, no one can guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship, and that Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessing be upon him, is the servant of Allah and his final messenger. My dear brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon you. Thank you for joining me for the second part of our series on the major sins. Now, in this particular program, I would like to discuss a little bit about the methodology that I'm going to be following, or the system, or the way that I'm going to be using to discuss this very, very important topic of the major sins. And basically what I'm going to be doing is going through a book. Uh, the book is called The Major Sins, it's called Al-Qaba'ir, and it's by Muhammad bin Uthman al-Zahabi. Uh, it's been translated into English, and alhamdulillah, there are several editions and several translations of this book, which alhamdulillah, you can actually download quite easily from the internet. So you might actually want to uh, download and even print out, or perhaps buy a copy of this book, inshallah. And as we're going through it, you might also like to refer to it as I'm going through it. Um, now, in this book, let me first of all tell you a little bit about the Sheikh himself, uh, al Dhahabi, alhamdulillah. He was uh, born in Damascus, um, and uh, he was a great scholar, alhamdulillah. And he studied under many, many, many different scholars, and he wrote, mashallah, many, many different works. Uh, and this particular book that he wrote, al Qabair, which has become a very popular book uh, on this topic of the major sins, he wrote mostly for the students of the Qur'an. He was uh, essentially based in Damascus throughout his life, and this is the book that we're going to be going through. Now, he listed about 70 major sins in his work. However, having gone through the book, I discovered there are some things that certainly even by his own criterion that would be considered to be major sins that he himself didn't include in the work. And also, according to my understanding, the logic of the way that he ordered the major sins, I thought could have been improved upon a little bit. So it's not necessarily that he has grouped the major sins together in his book in the way that is always logically consistent, or necessarily that he has started with the most major sins and systematically gone through to those that are less major. So what I'm going to try to do, I'm going to use the book as the basis of the lectures, but I may be moving some of the sins that he has put later on in the book to earlier on in the book, and vice versa. And I will be introducing a few topics, though not many, but a few topics that he didn't actually mention at all in the book. Or at least he didn't dedicate a specific chapter or a specific section to that topic of the major sins. So that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be going through the book. And my idea is to start with those sins that are the most serious ones first. But in addition to that, I'm going to try and group the sins that are similar together in the same series of lectures. So, for example, many of the sins of the tongue, like lying and slandering and backbiting and carrying tales, they are very, very similar not only in terms of the reality of those sins, but also in terms of the things that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned about them, and of course the verses of the Qur'an concerning them, they may be actually interchangeable. So it's useful to mention them as a group. Now, also what I intend to do throughout these series of lectures is to follow a simple methodology that is based upon 
something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said uddu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawa'idati al hasana wajadilhum billati hiya ahsanu actually this verse of the quran is very important understanding the methodology or the system that we should use when we are giving da'wah and when we are inviting people to Islam. This verse means, call to the way of your Lord. Uddu hila sabili rabbika. Call to the way of your Lord. Bil hikmati. With wisdom. And as some of the mufassirun, the people who explain the Quran, mention that hikmati here means the hikmah or the wisdom here means the Quran and the Sunnah, meaning the revelation. So we will start by mentioning the verses of the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, and the saying of the scholars in respect to this particular sin that we are going to be dealing with on that particular day. So that's what we will start with, Quran and Sunnah and the saying of the pious people. And then, Mawa'idhat al-Hasana. Mawa'idhat al-Hasana means a good admonition. And really, it is just reminding us about the consequence of our actions on the Day of Judgment. In fact, not only on the Day of Judgment, but in this life as well. So we will be talking about what are the consequences of these sins? What are the punishments in store for the people who commit those sins on the Day of Judgment? And do these sins have a specific punishment in the hellfire? That's what we're going to be discussing. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, which means, and argue with them, or debate, or discuss with them in the ways that are best. And in that section, what we will be trying to do is to understand the wisdom. And I know this is something that is very, very popular, and people really like to hear that these days. They like to understand not only, yes, Allah has said this is haram, and the Prophet wasallam said this is haram, and yes, this is the punishment for it on the Day of Judgment. But a lot of people, they want to know why, why, but why? What's the wisdom behind it? And of course, there is a lot of benefits in understanding the wisdom behind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibiting certain things. So if we can understand the wisdom behind it, well, that helps us in many different ways. From one angle, I suppose, it helps us and it gives us a type of certainty because many people these days, that is the way they think. They like to have a reasoned explanation for things and that's what we're going to try and do. We're going to try and give a reasoned explanation. Alhamdulillah. And also, also by the way, from the fiqh point of view, from the point of view of understanding the religion, it's also very important to understand, well, what is the wisdom behind this being prohibited and that being prohibited? Because it is possible that under certain exceptional circumstances, one may be allowed in some instances to transgress those sins and it would not be something that you are taken to account for. And I'll give you an example that we're all quite familiar with. And the example is, if for example, you are starving and you don't have anything to eat and the only thing that you have to eat is pork. Not only are you allowed to eat it, actually you have to eat it. It's haram for you not to keep yourself alive. And if all you have to eat is pork and there is nothing else, and that's all you have to eat to keep yourself alive, you actually have to eat it. Why? Because preserving yourself and preserving your life is more important than keeping away from that prohibition or following that prohibition of not eating pork. And another aspect of this which we would like to explore is also what do other religions and other philosophies say about this particular sin? Not only, of course, is this a very interesting subject, but it's very important for us as Muslims living in the world the way it is today, as we call it, the global village, 
with so much exposure to people with different ideas and different ways of thinking that we should really try to comprehend and understand, well, why do they think that we share similar ideas? And it could be very useful for us also in explaining to people about the beauty of this religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. So we will be introducing some of those aspects and also, inshallah, we will be looking at some of the statistics and some of the reality that we find existing when people are doing certain particular sins. So there are statistics, for example, concerning alcohol abuse, drug abuse, fornication, adultery, and many, many different types of sins, taking interest, for example. There are very interesting avenues to explore in regard to that. So if we have time and we have the ability and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the strength, we'll be looking into some of those things as well. Inshallah, we do hope that this is going to be a very, very interesting, as well, of course, as a very and highly important series uh, for you to be able to tune in and to educate yourself about, my dear brothers and sisters, because as I emphasize, this is a highly, highly important uh, topic. So that's, inshallah, our methodology we're going to be uh, using, inshallah. Another thing that we want to explore, of course, and this is something that Imam al-Dhahabi talks about in his book, so we might as well get the book now, and we'll start looking through the book. First of all, what does he talk about? Uh, in the beginning, he actually talks about this topic of what is a major sin. Now, before we actually start delving into the text of the book, I think it's very important to mention, brothers and sisters, that every sin is serious. Sin altogether is not an insignificant topic. And so when we talk about major sins, we shouldn't imagine, we should not imagine, my dear brothers and sisters, do not think that because some sins are considered or termed as major and some sins are termed minor, that means that you can just do the minor sins and it doesn't really matter. No, that would be a very big mistake because it's only that some sins are major when compared to other sins. That's what it means. So if you compare this sin to that sin, yes, this one is major and this one is not as serious as that one. In fact, the scholars warned us about thinking like that and having that mentality. Indeed, they stated uh, in many different ways that there is no such thing as a small sin when it is done often and thoughtlessly. Because if you do any sin often enough, and you do it not thinking about it, thoughtless, you're heedless, then in reality, those small sins together equal a big sin. As they gave the example, have you not seen the mountain? Is not the mountain made of small bits of stone? So if you have enough small bits of stone together, you have a mountain. If you have enough small sins, together, it makes something that is like a big sin. And they also said that there is no big sin with repentance. Or even a sin that is big, even a, a sin that is huge, if you repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that repentance eliminates that sin. So this is something to bear in mind, my dear brothers and sisters, may Allah have mercy upon you, that Every sin, however big, however severe, however terrible it is, the doors of forgiveness are always open. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always ready to forgive those who are sincere, who repent, feel remorse and who feel regret for the evil that they have done, and they turn to Him, and they beg Him, and they plead with Him for forgiveness, and they do their best not to commit that sin again. So for those people, most certainly and most definitely, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most compassionate, the most merciful, the most 
forgiving and the one who truly accepts repentance. So you should never imagine that there is a sin, however great it is, Allah will not forgive it. No. A person who thinks that does not understand and does not comprehend how vast and how great and how enormous is the forgiveness and the mercy and the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's remind ourselves of that again. Many small sins done heedlessly, without thinking about it, not thinking this, you know, significant, together can equal a big sin. And a big sin, if you truly repent and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, then Allah certainly is the most forgiving. And that repentance wipes away those sins. So that is very important. In fact, some scholars, they even disputed the idea of there being major and minor sins. Some scholars said there's no such things as small sins. All sins are major. And they said, and they have a saying about that, that don't think about how big the sin is. Don't think whether the sin is big or small. But what you should think about, how great is the one whom you are sinning against? How great is the one who you are disobeying? If you think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you think that the wise, the lawmaker, the just, the merciful Allah has told us to do something and we don't do it. And he has warned us about something, yet we still fall into it. In reality, what does that say about our belief in Allah? What does that say about our understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, I'm sure any one of you, my dear brothers and sisters, may Allah have mercy upon you. Any one of you who's a parent, any one of you who's a parent, you don't like it that your children will consider anything you say insignificant. If you give them an order, even if it's a relatively insignificant one, it doesn't please you, they would disobey you. So how much more, how infinitely more, and we don't compare Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his creation, but how much more is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserving of our obedience? Since we're human beings, we make mistakes. We could even order our children to do something wrong, unknowingly, or maybe even knowingly. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is free from all defects. He is free from all errors. If Allah has ordered us to do something, it's from his perfect and complete knowledge and wisdom. So don't think about, is this a big sin? Is this a small sin? No. Remember, this is Allah telling you, don't do this. It is Allah ordering you, do this. And think about Allah. Think about the one who is ordering you and prohibiting you. This is something that you need to bear in mind. However, in this issue, my dear brothers and sisters, is there such thing as a big sin or not? Well, what we need to do is we need to go back to the revelation. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, O oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those who have been given authority amongst you. And if you differ in anything, if you differ in anything amongst yourselves, refer it to Allah and his messenger. If you believe in Allah and the last day, and that is from Surah An-Nisa, which is the fourth surah in the 59th ayah. So this is what we do. We have a disagreement about anything. We always will refer it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. What does the Quran say? What does the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? And if we go and we look to the Quran, we will find when we go back to the book here by Imam al dhahab the major sins, if we go back to the book, we will find very clearly he gives some proof from the Quran. In tajtanibu kaba'ira. It means, verily, if you leave or if you avoid the major sins, matanhauna, that you have been prohibited. 
So it's very clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in the Quran, if you avoid the major part of what you have been forbidden to do, we will cancel your other evil deeds. Subhanallah. If you avoid the major sins, the major part of what you have been prohibited from, then we will cancel out your other evil deeds and we will admit you to paradise with a noble entry. Mudkhal karim, a noble entry. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah An-Nisa in the 31st ayah. And also we find in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentioned also وَالَّذِينَ يَجْتَنِبُونَ kabaira. Again those who leave and abandon the big sins and the greater sins وَفَاحِشَ and the indecencies and they forgive when they are angry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that. That's in Surah Ashura in the 42nd Surah in the 37th Ayah. And again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah An-Najm which is the 53rd Surah in the 32nd Ayah. Those who avoid the greater sins and indecencies except for oversights. They will find that surely your Lord is ample in forgiveness. So from those verses of the Quran, it is very, very clear that there are those sins that are the big sins, the qaba'ir, and that if we avoid those major sins, if we avoid the major part of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited us from, then those minor things, those lesser sins, and minor only in the sense that they're not as great as the major sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will overlook them for us. So it shows and establishes that there is, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a gradation of sins. And also the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, the five daily prayers, Friday to Friday and Ramadan to Ramadan, make atonement for what has happened since the previous one when major sins have been avoided. And this is what the hadith mentions also, when major sins have been avoided. So therefore also it is clear that between the five daily prayers and in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, and he mentioned, he gave the example of a man who passes through a river. If on his way to his house, every day, five times a day, he goes through a river, Will he not be clean and clean from all dirt? They said, yes, O Messenger of Allah. He said, that's the five prayers. The five prayers wipe out the sins like that, as long as the major sins have been avoided. So you can see, my brothers and sisters, why it is so important for us to understand and to know what are the major sins. So what are the major sins and how do we know what the major sins are? What distinguishes a major from a minor sin? That's what we're going to explore in our next session. So please make sure you join us for that. Until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.